your Bibles again with me to Ephesians chapter 6. As we continue to explore how we can gain the victory in 2023 by putting on our spiritual armor. And as I mentioned earlier, we are continuing to talk about the shield of faith. One evening, a number of years ago, a videographer who had himself just completed initial skydiving training wanted to make a a jump filming skydivers as they jumped out of the aircraft and were in free fall and then catch them as their chutes were opening. He thought it would be a, a wonderful thing to do with very unique camera perspectives and he had it all planned out to the T. As the plane prepared for takeoff, he was just excited and, and his and his Stomach was in his throat and, and, and butterflies and all the nine yards and all the excitement of, of the jump and, and everything was, was going through his mind of how he would meticulously try to maneuver his way around to different skydivers to even catch the expressions on their face. But as it tragically turned out, perhaps he was a little bit too excited. On the film shown on a live telecast as the final skydiver in free fall opened their chute. All of a sudden, the picture went berserk. There were some very tense moments of silence, and then an announcer interrupted in tears, saying that the cameraman had fallen to his death. In his haste and excitement, To film the jump, he had completely forgotten to put on his own parachute. He jumped out of a plane and was in total free fall with nothing to stop him from falling to his death. He had acted in deadly foolishness and haste, and there was nothing that could save him. Why would I tell you such a depressing story on a beautiful Sunday morning? Because, dear friends, when when you choose to go into your daily life without the armor of God on and, above all, without the shield of faith with you, you are leaving yourselves open for a free fall into sin. Because, make no mistake about it, your enemy is much more powerful than you are But God gives us all that we need because the shield of faith, if you will allow another analogy, is like a parachute that will keep you because and and protect you from free falling into the black abyss of sin. The shield of faith prevents the weak places in our armor from being opened and exposed. And like I mentioned earlier, it is the primary source of defense against the enemy's assault. So let's explore more about what faith is, what, what, excuse me, what faith is not, what faith is, and then how we can grow in our faith. And build the strength of our shield. Let's remind ourselves of the key verse here in Ephesians chapter 6. Just verse 16 this morning regarding the shield of faith. Please stand with me again in honor of God's word as we read this together. And then we'll discover what faith is, what it's not, and how we can grow in it. Ephesians 6.16 says, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Thank you. Be seated. So first, we're going to explore the fact that daily faith for the believer is the assurance not only that God exists, but that he is with us. That he 
doesn't just exist somewhere out there in the cosmos as the deists believe. He's not just a watchmaker God who who created everything, spun it into motion, and then just sits back and laughs at all of our ineptitude and inadequacy. If you believe that, dear friend, then you do not believe in a personal God who saves. The Bible says that even Satan and his demons believe that God exists and they tremble. They quake at the thought of an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-existent God. It's not enough just to believe that God exists. Because saving faith means that you have accepted His way, the way, the only way to a right relationship with Him, as the Bible says, through Jesus Christ. Faith is reliance and confidence. It's the basis, the foundational element of our our relationship with God, and it comes and flows from the Word of God. And that's where the belt of truth and the shield of faith are like a double layer of protection. Remember when we talked about the belt of truth, a belt wasn't just like a belt that holds your pants up today. The belt of a soldier was literally what connected all of the other pieces of of armor and held them firmly in place. So the belt of truth held the the breastplate of righteousness firmly in place that protects your heart. And then when you have the shield out front, you have that double layer of protection in all the different areas of your spiritual life. We can't pick and choose which parts of the Bible we believe cafeteria style. There are some denominations some religions that try to do that. Oh, we don't, we don't like the part uh, that talks about the resurrection. It, it, it's fairly impossible that anybody rose from the dead. I, I, we can't conceive that, so we're going to hold that part. Or, you know what, those miracles of, of Jesus that are, are in the four Gospels, eh, I'm not sure about those. I don't like I don't like this part. I don't like that part. We're either all in or you're all out because the Bible says that you add one jot or one tittle. In other words, in in, in Greek, a jot or a tittle can make can change the meaning of the entire word. Just one little mark. So if you try to exclude or in exclude what's in there or include something that's not, dear friend, then you are not a believer because your faith is in what you create and the lies that you allow into your own mind rather than based on the truth of God's word. And that leads me to my first point about faith because what faith is not is based on feelings. Faith is not based on feelings. You know, a lot of people today live according to their feelings. Actress Sharon Stone famously said that my day is determined by what mood I'm in. If you are driven by feelings, if you're driven by moods, if you're driven by your emotions, then you are driven by falsehoods and and misrepresentations and impressions rather than facts. Because it's not about emotions and inner impressions. Things that you say to yourself like, I just, I just feel like this is going to work out. God wasn't in it. And they say, maybe I didn't have enough faith. The problem wasn't in the amount of their faith, but in the object of their faith. 
We, we never should place our faith in feelings. Our faith should be coupled with the facts. Our faith must be rooted and grounded in the absolute inerrant truth of God's word. Because if it's not, and if, if, our, if the, the faith that we have is in ourselves, and, and this is where this worldly philosophy, the secular humanistic philosophy where, that, that says just believe in yourself. You hear this everywhere. You hear it in public education. You even hear athletes. I believe in myself and I believe in my teammates and that allowed me to go out on the field today and, and perform at a very high level. It's everywhere. But what is that rooted in? It's rooted in some kind of self-generated faith. If, you're, if your faith is just in yourself, then you're only going to get what you can achieve. But if you want to place your faith in God and, and in Christ, then you're going to get what only He can achieve. If your faith is in anything else, if your faith is, is, in, is in your knowledge, your intellect, if your faith is in your education, if your faith is in other people, if it's in anything else but God, then you're only going to get what those other things can bring forth. And all that is temporary. Would you rather place your faith in something temporary that's going to disappear? Or would you rather place your faith in something permanent That will always endure. Feelings change. They fade away. And this is why I believe so many marriages fail. Because you you talk to someone who's in the process of, of, of filing for a divorce. And they say things like, we just fell out of love. Because that love was based on feelings rather than facts. The fact of the matter is that you didn't just enter into a contract, you entered into a covenant when you took those marriage vows that God takes very seriously. And when your faith is based on feelings rather than facts, it can take you down all kinds of dark paths and into all kinds of negative circumstances and consequences that you never intended. But dear friend, when your faith is based on fact, it is firm. We need to place our faith in facts, not feelings. We're not called to trust our instincts. We're called to trust in the unchanging God of the universe and upon His Word. Feelings come and feelings go, and feelings are very deceiving. As for me and my house... We will not only serve the Lord, but we will trust in the Lord. So faith is not based on feeling. Another thing that faith is not based on is your circumstances. Great theologian and pastor George Mueller wrote, The process of faith begins where, pro- where possibilities cease. It is not probable that a little shepherd boy could kill a giant with a a slingshot and a stone. Probability says no, but faith says yes. As one author wrote, doubt sees the obstacles, faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darkest night, but faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step, but faith soars high. Doubt questions who believes. Faith answers, I. Faith is not based in what you can see. Faith is not based in your circumstances. And this is where a lot of churches get into trouble and they miss God. Because they look at their bank account, they look at the resources, they look at the, at the membership, and they say, we can't do that because we don't have what's necessary. But they forget to say, but God does. 
God has everything that's necessary to accomplish anything according to his unimaginable perfect will. But people limit God. They try to put God in a box that's only the size of the resources that they see. But faith is believing in what you cannot see. Amen? Without faith, as we read last Sunday, it is impossible to please God. But yet we, we govern and we, and we manage our churches according to worldly philosophy rather than faith in the, in the word of God. And who God is. And it gets us into trouble. And we miss out on God's immense blessings. So faith is not based on feeling. And it's not based on circumstances. And finally, faith is not based on sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. I read the story about World War II, at the close of World War II, the Allied forces were searching abandoned homes and cars. They entered the basement of a house in ruins. A Jewish couple had spent time in there, victims of the Holocaust. Scratched into the wall of that basement were these words, I believe in the sun even when it does not shine. I believe in love even when it is not shown, and I believe in God, even when I can't hear him speak. Faith has absolutely nothing to do with appearances, but we are of a world that that is so appearances-driven. We think that if we can dress it up, make it up, tuck it up, change how we look, on the outside, that we're going to be able to fool a lot of people about how we really appear. But dear friend, God sees right through all of that superficiality. He sees through all of the efforts that you make to, uh, to spruce up your appearance because God is not appearances driven. Amen? God sees through to who you really are. And likewise, the faith that His Holy Spirit gives us doesn't just focus on the outside. Faith allows to see through the eyes of the Savior Himself. And and when you look at a lost world through the, the vision of Jesus Christ, you see people. You don't see uh, things that annoy you. You don't you, don't, you no longer view people as interruptions to your day. You see people who desperately need Jesus, and it allows you to look at the world through faith lenses. And it calls you to service. It calls you to compassion. It calls you to be a witness. A man of God started a orphanage with two shillings which is the amount of the equivalent amount of 50 cents he had previously made up his mind that when in need he would never ask another human being for help only god over the years these two shillings grew into five massive granite buildings covering 13 acres capable of accommodating 2000 orphans through prayer alone George Mueller saw $7 million given, and this was a couple of centuries ago. More than once, he sat at the table with hungry orphans without a grain of food in front of them and blessed the food that God had on the way, only to be interrupted by a knock at the door with a person bringing another donation of food. Faith has nothing to do with appearances. But why is it that we would often rather trust in other things for our provision, for our security, for life itself rather than the Lord? We are called as believers in Jesus Christ to place our faith in Him alone. 
So faith is not based on feeling. It's not based on circumstances. And dear friend, it is not based on sight. That's what faith is not. Now let's see what faith is. Faith is not based on feeling. It is rooted in fact. Feelings are short-lived and often misleading as we talked about. So if our faith relies on our feelings, then we will waver and be tossed around with every single storm of circumstances that enters our lives. Someone wrote a little poem called Feeling, Faith, and Fact. When feeling took an awful fall, faith was taken aback. So close was was faith to feeling that he fell and stumbled too. But when all the dust settled, fact remained. And that's just a a little bit of prose to remind us that Our faith should be tied to facts, not feelings. Because when 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 your faith is based on facts, on the truth of God's word, rather than feelings, it allows you to stand firm and remain strong. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul reminded us four times in Ephesians uh, 6, 10 through 16. Stand firm. Be strong. And this is where the shield of faith and the belt of truth once again form that double layer of protection for each of us as believers. Paul wrote about this again in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 13 and 14. He wrote there, until we all reach the unity of of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. So dear friend, what is your faith rooted in? Feelings? Or fact. And then faith is a growing relationship with God. Faith is a growing relationship with God. There can be no doubt that it is God's will for everything, every living thing that He creates to grow. I may have shared with you before that I'm not fond of cats. And for those of you who are cat lovers, I, I apologize. I'm not going to. I'm not, I'm not going to say anything derogatory about cats. But even though I don't like cats very much, I love kittens. Kittens are playful and they're furry and they're fun, and they and they chase yarn balls. But the problem with kittens is they grow into cats. Now a dog. A dog will love you unconditionally. My, my dog Cosmo, yes, he is driven by the baser instincts of food and, and love. But he'll cuddle up beside you and he wants to jump on your lap just because he loves you. A cat only pays you attention when it needs something. That's at least my experience. But every living thing, God gave the capacity to grow. And in a perfect world, as God created it, every living thing would have all that it needed to live its its entire life. There would be no death. As a matter of fact, it would be to live for eternity, amen? That's how God created the world in absolute perfection, to have constant and eternal communion with Him. But uh, alas, dear friend, in case you haven't noticed... We don't live in a perfect world. We live in a a fallen world. And that complicates the growth dynamic. Because now, in order to find... Think about your plants. My my wife spent a lot of time, effort, and and money uh, on, on our yard outside. She meticulously made sure that the plants were watered. Even in the heat of summer, she was out there with a garden hose. If it wasn't raining enough, 
watering all the plants, making sure they had all the nutrients that they needed, all the sunlight, put repositioning her potted plants if it wasn't getting enough sun. And then the horrible four-night hard freeze happened in December. And this beautiful tropical bed that we had right outside our screened-in porch is now what I not so affectionately refer to as the dead bed. Everything in the bed is brown and sagging and dead. Debbie looked out there the other day and one, one of her ginger plants had one leaf coming out from underneath the death and it was once again showing a sign of life. So maybe it didn't die all the way down to the roots, but that freeze sure wiped out everything above the ground. And we had even covered them. We'd done everything that we could to protect those plants. But again, we live in a fallen world where bad things happen, even with all the good intentions that you have. And make no mistake about it that the enemy wants to oppose your spiritual growth. He first and foremost wants to oppose you ever believing in Christ. As long as you will put off receiving Christ as your Savior, he has you right where he wants you because you are a sinner just like the rest of us. We're all born that way, but the difference is those who have received Christ now have a new life. They have Uh, They have the power of God. They have God living in them through the Holy Spirit. But those who are without Christ are still subject to sin. Whether they realize it or not, they may think that they may be tricked into believing they're living according to their own terms and their own whims and their own way. But make no mistake about it, as the old spiritual used to say, you're going to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to serve somebody. He opposes your salvation, but then once you are saved, oh no, the battle isn't over. That's why we have the armor of God to begin with. The battle rages. Then he wants to prevent you from growing. He wants to keep you an immature baby Christian that's still craving milk instead of solid food. And what I mean by that, that's, that's just a, an analogy of the, the Word of God, growing in the Word of God, growing in what God wants to show you and how He wants to change you more and more on a daily basis into the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. He opposes that growth. But there is no doubt that He desires for us to grow. And a growing relationship with God is where the shield of faith comes in each and every day because as you raise the shield of faith, it wards off temptation for our thoughts and our actions to plunge into sin and selfishness. And the shield of faith coupled with the rest of the armor of God allows us to focus and dwell on the things of God. And then that makes verses like Philippians 4.8 possible, where Paul writes, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think on such things." Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Faith is rooted in fact in a growing relationship. As you grow in Christ, you will find that your thoughts dwell more and more on those beautiful, pure, true, noble, right things of God. And you allow the things of God to replace the sinful desires and lusts that so easily can overtake your life. So we've seen what faith is not, what faith is, and then let's explore together how faith grows. 
Three keys to a growing faith. How can we make our shield of faith larger and stronger and increase the faith that we have? Well, first and foremost, faith grows through consistency. Now, this is boring. Consistency. I want dynamic. I want excitement. But you know, you know what employers appreciate? Somebody who shows up on time and is reliable every single day. Do you want to start great? I'm great at starting things. Finishing things? How consistent are you? Can you look back on your life in Christ and say that you have consistently grown? Or are you like the, the stock market, up and down and up and down? You know, I, I, for, for a while, I got caught up in, in the stock market. And I, I would watch the stock market every single day. And that was a big mistake. Because it made me very impatient when I looked at my retirement account and it was up and it was down and it was all around and it was driven by all these economic forces that I had absolutely no control over. But as my financial advisor, like a good friend of mine that I've known for years, he says, stay the course. Things go up, things go down on a daily basis, but it's over the long haul that you'll see the gains that you're looking for. Just stay the course. I have learned something about myself. I'm not very good sometimes at staying the course. I get impetuous and I get impatient. Maybe you can relate to that. And instead of looking, keeping my eyes fixed on Jesus, I look on the here and now and the circumstances around me, and that affects my consistency. That's how we are as flawed human beings. You don't obtain strong faith all at once. It must be through consistent effort. An infant doesn't become an adult all at once. It's incremental growth have have you ever woken up one day and realized that your child was suddenly four or five inches taller than they were and you didn't see it on a daily basis all you know is that their pants are high waters and you never even noticed it happened so quickly yeah i see some parents smiling it's happening right because all living things are ordained by God to grow. But that growth, it may seem like they shot up all at once, but really there were consistent things happening in their body. The, the proper nutrition, the proper amount of rest, all of the, the nutrients that they, that they needed in order for that growth to happen. And that happened through consistent effort by you as the parent as well as them as the, as the individual. Consistency matters. How consistent are you? Are you up and down and all around and no one can really rely on where you're going to be or what you're going to say or what you're going to do? Or are you that consistent presence? of faithfulness and positivity and encouragement. The good news is consistency is a skill that can be learned. It can be attained. And if, as we strive to be more like Jesus, we need to strive to be more consistent. Amen? Because we believe that God is unchanging. The theological term there is immutability. God is immutable, unchanging. And you're not perfect, 
and neither am I, but we can strive to take on the mind and the heart of Christ and at least grow. So if consistency is something that you struggle with, I want to encourage you to start praying for God to help grow that attribute in you. Because that's how faith grows, through consistency. The soldier doesn't become fit for battle in a day, do they, Brother Sherman? It takes training. It takes discipline. It takes good, superior officers or enlisted people above them. And it may not always be through gentleness. <laughs> Sometimes it takes hard work and it takes tough love. So if you are wishy-washy and inconsistent and unreliable, I want to encourage you to begin to pray and seek the Lord and surround yourself, by the way, with people who are consistent and learn from their wisdom. And faith also grows through conflict. You know, different people have different ways of managing conflict. Some people run from it. They refuse to engage in any type of conflict. If, if they see conflict coming, they're going to avoid, go into full-on avoidance mode. Then on the other extreme, there are those who crave conflict who are constantly saying something to try to set somebody off or, or, just, or just trying to tweak some, someone, or, they're con or, or if they're not in conflict, they're trying to create conflict between someone else. They're the instigators, if you will. They're the ones who are always needling. And a lot of them, they're passive-aggressive because they like other people's conflict. And they like sitting back and watching while other people go to war. But then, there's a proper approach. Because sometimes growth just can't happen unless there's conflict. Make no mistake about it, that the Bible teaches us that we are to thank God for the trials. That we are supposed to be grateful in all things and thank Him for allowing those difficulties and those trials because it's only through those that we learn who we are, we get a proper perspective of where we are in our spiritual development, and then it, it, as we learn to, to quit praying, why me, God, or get me out of this, God, and start praying, Lord, what would you have me to learn and how, do you, how would you need me to change through this difficulty? When we start seeing the kingdom purposes in our struggles and in our trials, that is an indicator of your personal spiritual growth. And it was only through that conflict and through that difficulty and through that challenge that you were even equipped to grow. I, I read about trees. And especially trees in, in areas that are, that are prone uh, to, to storms, uh, there's an interesting phenomenon that happens. Under, you know, trees have, of course, have the rings that with age, but did you know that trees also have the, the ability that's built into them that, that the, the wood will actually twist and strengthen like, like a, a three-strand cord is not easily broken, as we read in the book of Ecclesiastes, I believe. Uh, and, and trees will actually twist to strengthen uh, their ability to stand in the midst of a storm. And, and that's exactly what conflict does. It, it twists and strengthens our lives into that three-strand cord or rope that it cannot easily snap. And that's why God ordains and allows difficulty in our lives to grow us, to help us, to build us. But He, because He cares far more about your spiritual growth and your kingdom impact while you're here than, your, than the comfort level that you have in your current circumstances. 
He cares a lot more about your growth than he does your comfort. And that's hard. And that's not an easy thing to hear. But dear friend, I just want to encourage you that if you're going through struggle, to take heart. Because God has a purpose and a plan. James 1, 2, and 2 through 3 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. There it is. Heard a story about a little boy who was trying to put a puzzle together. He had mastered the 100 piece and the 250 piece, and he, was, he, he had gone on to the 500 piece. But he had just a, a, a small section, but all the colors were confusing, and they were duplicated for, in other places, and he couldn't figure out how to get those last few pieces together. He was so frustrated that he even resorted to asking his little sister for help. In seconds, the young girl had come to the puzzle, said, oh, put all the pieces together and put them in place. She showed him the front of the box. He said, she just said to her brother, I looked at the picture. You were just focused on the pieces. God sees the big picture. God sees the, the, the end that he has in mind. You may not be able to see it because you're so buried in the pieces of your circumstances. But when you have faith, when you're holding up the shield of faith, here's what that allows that to do. God, I can't see the outcome and I can't see what you're doing in this, but I trust you that you have a plan and a purpose. So Lord, give me the strength to endure whatever you have for me because I know that it's for your ultimate purpose and for my good. You're making me stronger as a result. Because life sometimes is like a puzzle. God holds the big picture. We're just called to hold the shield of faith. And when we believe him, even when we don't understand or can't see, that's when faith really stands the strongest. So dear friend, I want to encourage you this morning to take up the shield of faith, to extinguish the fiery arrows of the enemy. By understanding what faith is, what faith is not, and how you can grow as you Build your faith through consistency and allow the, the difficulty in your life to strengthen your faith rather than, than drain it. If your faith is based on fact rather than feelings and moods and impressions, your faith can stand the test of time. And your faith can even become a shield not just for yourself, but for others as well. Let's pray together.